Hello everyone and welcome to our mini PCR bio webinar about qPCR and COVID-19 testing. I'm Alex Danis and I'm really excited to be able to talk with you about this today and talk about what qPCR is and how we can use it to try and diagnose disease. So I'm joined in the chat today uh, by Bruce and Sebastian and Allie from Mini PCR. So you might see them jumping in and answering some questions as we go if you put them in the chat. Uh, and I noticed that Sebastian has also just added in some student questions and a link there. So if you want to download that document and follow along with us today and answer those questions as we go, uh, the answers will be the answers to the test, which is in there, will be in the webinar. So download that, follow along, and we'll all go through it together. So uh, today, of course, we're going to be talking about qPCR and COVID-19. And we're going to talk about a number of different things today. So first of all, we've all been hearing a lot in the news about COVID-19 and probably some sort of jargony words in there as well. Things like qPCR, false positives, false negatives, all of these different kinds of things, polymerase chain reaction. So we're going to talk a little bit about what those technologies are, what does or how does qPCR work and what it is. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about how we can take this diagnostic process and bring it to a classroom or even right now to an apartment. So what can we do to actually bring the fundamentals and the principles of this into uh, the classroom in a bit more of an accessible setting? And then also how can we use these principles to try and expand diagnostic testing? Because as I'm sure you've heard, expanding testing is gonna be really critical as we move forwards through this era of COVID-19. So, First of all, what is a virus? I want to do a slight recap here. Again, you've probably been hearing all about viruses recently. So a virus really has two main important parts. So first of all, it has some sort of nucleic acid genome. This can be DNA or it can be RNA. And then it's got some sort of shell that surrounds it. So at the most basic level, this can be a protein capsid or in some viruses like SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, this might also be sort of a lipid envelope, sort of like a membrane around it. And there are a wide variety of viruses all around our world and through uh, the kingdom of biology. So we have uh, viruses that can infect bacteria and animals and plants and humans. And of course, today we're speaking about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. So again, I just want to lay out really the definitions of both of these before we dive deep on in. So COVID-19 is the disease that we've all been hearing about a lot that many people have been affected by. And SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus that causes that disease. So we're going to be talking a lot uh, and using both of these terms today. So I want to get that clear and upfront that SARS-CoV-2 is this uh, virus that is depicted here. You can see that it has an RNA genome. It's about 30,000 bases long. And to put that into perspective, our human genome is 3.2 billion DNA bases long. So this is actually a pretty short genome as far as genomes go. That RNA genome is wrapped in these uh, nucleocapsid proteins, and then that whole thing is surrounded by a lipid envelope. You can see those little spike proteins on the side. Sometimes these are depicted as little red spikes. You've probably seen that image floating around in the news recently. And those spikes are what bind to a receptor on your cells that let it into uh, your actual cells in your lungs where it can replicate and go on to make more virus. So SARS-CoV-2 is the virus, and it has an RNA genome. So. You may be hearing again a lot about COVID-19 testing, and there are a couple different types of tests that are out there right now, but the one we're going to spend most of our time today talking about is something called a qPCR test that all starts with a swab. So we'll get into the details of qPCR in a minute, but you may have again also seen on the news people getting these big long swabs up their noses. And what is all of that about? So the idea is that the people who are taking these swabs, the doctors and the clinicians, they're taking this swab of what's happening at the very back of sort of your nasopharyngeal passage. So way back here in the very back of your throat, that's where the virus lives. So they're gonna take a swab from that back there and see if you have that SARS-CoV-2 virus currently active in that area of your respiratory system. That is what they're looking for. So we're trying to see, is that present? But if we think about this swab, you're swabbing way back up in there. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of things actually on that swab. So you might see some human cells. You might see some human uh, epithelial cells, right, that are coming from you. They're swabbing you. 
You might also see some bacteria in there. So again, you know, we are all covered in microbes at all times. You're probably going to get some bacteria on that swab too. You may also find other viruses. You might find the common cold virus, or you might find the flu virus. So there might be other viruses on that swab. And then finally, you might also have the coronavirus. You might have SARS-CoV-2, which is back there uh, in, your, in your swab. So we need to do something to try and isolate just SARS-CoV-2 in that swab and actually show that, uh, that it is present from all of that other stuff in there. And what we're going to do is we're going to specifically look for the RNA in SARS-CoV-2 to find out and see, okay, is that RNA present in this swab? But again, you can't see RNA with the naked eye, and there's going to be a lot of different nucleic acids, a lot of different things on that swab. So we can use something called PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, to look at all of those different nucleic acids on that swab and try and specifically isolate just the one that we are interested in. So at its most basic level, PCR can find and replicate a specific nucleic acid target. And again, as I mentioned before, SARS-CoV-2 has an RNA genome. So right now we're gonna be talking about amplifying DNA. We'll get into the specifics of how we turn that RNA into DNA for this uh, lab procedure in just a minute. But for now, I'm gonna use the general term nucleic acid, but really we're looking at sort of that whole DNA RNA uh, landscape that's on that swab. So with PCR, you have a complex DNA sample. And again, if we think about our human genome, that's 3.2 billion base pairs long, maybe if you wanted to amplify a single gene out of the human genome, it might be something like 500 bases. So you have some region of interest in that much bigger complex DNA sample, and you're gonna make it a lot easier to find by amplifying it over and over and over until when you look at this sample, you can see way more of the piece you're looking at than all that other stuff that you don't. So if we think about this specifically for what's on our swab, again, we have all of these different things. We have human cells, bacterial cells, other viruses, and then SARS-CoV-2, which is what we're looking for. And the only part of that that we want to really find is just that RNA genome from SARS-CoV-2. And we want to isolate that from all the other DNA and RNA that might be from those other sources in this sample. And so to do that, we're going to make over a billion copies of just that piece that we're interested in to see if it's actually present. So before we get into the very uh, specific um, uh, ways in which PCR does this within our little test tubes that look like this, our little PCR tubes, and we'll get to those in a moment, I want to give you an example of the power of PCR. So imagine that you have taken everything in that swab, right? You've taken all of the different DNA sequences from the humans, from potential viruses, from bacteria, and you've printed them out on sheets of paper with 500 bases per sheet. So for the human genome, you're gonna have a stack of paper that is a third of a mile high, because if you take our 3.2 billion base pairs and you print them out 500 bases on a sheet of paper and stack them way up, you're gonna see that uh, that pile of paper is a third of a mile high. But our SARS-CoV-2 genome would only be about a quarter of an inch high. So imagine you were trying to find one sheet of paper out of this quarter inch in a stack of paper a third of a mile tall. It's going to be really, really hard to find. And remember, too, in something like the swab sample, you're also going to have bacterial genomes and other virus genomes. And you're going to have all of these different things, and you're searching for such a tiny, tiny portion of it. So. How do you find just that specific SARS-CoV-2 genome? And typically when we're doing uh, PCR, we're not even looking for the whole genome, we're looking for a small piece of it. So we're looking in this example for just one sheet out of that quarter inch of paper in this mile high stack. So what we can do is we can use polymerase chain reaction, which is like taking that one sheet of paper, putting it through a photocopier, and now making two copies. And then you take those two copies, you put them back through the photocopier, and now you have four copies. And you take those four copies and you put them back and you do this over and over and over so you are exponentially amplifying that region that you're interested in until you end up with a stack of paper that is 63 miles high. So now imagine that you have a 63 mile high stack of paper that is that piece of the SARS-CoV-2 genome you're interested in, and then all that other stuff is about a third of a mile high. 
it's going to be a lot easier to find the region of DNA that you are interested in now, now that you have made many, many copies of it. So how does this actually work in our tubes? So what you do is you're going to add a number of different things to these tubes, and we'll go over that again a little later, but you're going to have your initial uh, starting sample that is your complex DNA sample. And then what you're going to do is you're going to denature that. So you're going to use heat to separate the two strands of DNA in that sample apart. You're also going to add something called primers to your tube. So these are short pieces of DNA that will bind to the beginning and the end of your region of interest. And what you're going to do is in your thermocycler, uh, which I have an example of right here. So this is a machine that really all it's going to do is it's going to heat your samples up and cool them down. So you have your tubes, you put them in here, you heat them up to 94 to get those uh, two strands to come apart, and then you cool it down to between 50 to 65 degrees Celsius to get those uh, primers to bind to the beginning and end ooh, of the region that you're interested in. And now that you've done that, one of the other things that you've added to your tube is something called a DNA polymerase. So this is a TAC polymerase. So what it's going to do is it is going to find those double-stranded regions that now have the primer bound to your uh, larger DNA sample. And they're going to use all these spared DNTPs, these building blocks of DNA, to go along and make a copy of that. So again, now after just one cycle of PCR where you denature, anneal your primers, and then extend your region, you've turned your one copy of target DNA into two copies of target DNA. And you're gonna do this in a typical PCR reaction for about 30 to 35 cycles, and you're gonna wind up with a billion copies of that original piece of target DNA that you were interested in. So PCR is great. Uh, it's an amazingly useful tool that has really transformed how molecular biology has done over the past few decades. But the thing that usually follows up PCR is an electrophoresis gel. So you take your samples, you run them out on a gel, and you see, is that piece of DNA that I'm interested in present or not present? So here we have an example where each of these different lanes, we've put a different PCR uh, reaction that's been cycled over and over in, and each of these bright bands means that we have replicated lots and lots of pieces of that target DNA. So here is an example of a band where we have a positive. That piece of DNA that we were interested in was present in our initial sample. So for something like uh, virus testing, we could say that yes, that virus was present in our initial sample. Or over here, we have a lane where no, it was not present in our initial sample. So PCR is amazing uh, with gel electrophoresis for these yes or no answers. Is it there? Is it not there? But sometimes, we want more than just a yes or no answer. Sometimes we want to know, was there a lot of it to start with or just a little bit of it to start with? So this can be really important in some things like diagnostics. So for some viruses like HIV and herpes, knowing whether or not you have a lot of the virus present or just a little bit of the virus present is actually really important to diagnosis and treatment. So we can't just look at the final end point of that reaction, so this gel, and say, okay, yes, it's there or no, it's not. We need some way of figuring out how much you started with. Did you start off with a lot or did you start off with a little? And doing it this way with PCR and electrophoresis, you pretty much just get that yes or no answer. So, a great way to think about this, again, if you start off with a lot or a little, is that as you're doing this uh, amplification over and over, there's going to be a difference in how they get to that final end point. So a great uh, way to think about this that actually Bruce, who might be down in the chat, pointed out is to think about it like going to see a race. So there's been a marathon long race and you end up at the finish line after the race is over. What you can do is you can figure out who ran and who didn't run, but it's a lot harder to figure out who came in first, second, and third, and what that order was. So by showing up to PCR at the very end, you can figure out, okay, this DNA was or was not present, but it's hard to know exactly how much of it there was to begin and what order it uh, doubled at. So it's gonna be a little easier to understand when we look at this example. So we're starting off here with two samples, one of which had a low concentration of our starting target, and one of which had a high concentration of our starting target. So as this goes, every time it doubles, right at the beginning here, uh, you can see, again, we've got 
two copies going to four copies going to eight copies so you know it's a pretty low amount of dna that's going but because this is an exponential amplification at some point this orange sample here which is the high uh copy or high starting value sample uh starts to really take off so it starts to double um, it's not doubling faster, it's doubling at the same rate, but because it had so much more to begin with, now it's going from something like 100,000 to 200,000, so it's increasing at a much uh, faster rate at the specific point than uh, something that you know is currently going from 8 to 16 copies. So you're seeing a much steeper curve as it's going up. And if we watch these two cycles continue to go, at each cycle they're climbing and they both reach the same place, they both reach the same plateau endpoint, but if you were to show up in the middle of the race, say at cycle 20 or the middle of the PCR run, you're going to see that there's already way more amplification of this orange line than there is of this blue line. And so that'll tell you that we started off with way more uh, of this orange starting DNA than we did of the blue. So you can cut these two uh, sort of phases of PCR into what we call the exponential phase and then the plateau phase. So again, when we're looking at this here, we have this exponential amplification at the beginning, and then we hit some sort of plateau. And typically that's because we're running out of reagents in our tubes, right? We've put a certain number of primers, we've put a certain number of DNTPs. So it reaches that endpoint, and then at some point it just runs out of reagents in the tube to keep making more, more copies. So um, ideally, if we had infinite reagents in that tube, that exponential phase might forever go on forever and ever, but we don't, so it hits this plateau where it stops exponentially amplifying. Um, and so, again, endpoint PCR, where we're running a PCR and then putting it into a gel, we're typically just looking at that plateau phase. We're looking at the end of the race to see who ran, but qPCR can actually let us look at the reaction as it's happening. So. How does that work? How are we looking at this reaction as it's happening in our tube? Because again, remember, it's just happening in a machine like this. How are we actually looking to see how many copies of DNA we have? What's going on? How are we viewing that? Now, the way it does this, and it's actually really cool, is that it uses a fluorescent dye. So qPCR uses a fluorescent dye that binds to double but not single-stranded DNA. So as we're making more and more copies, you have a fluorescent signal that's getting brighter and brighter in your tube. And so every cycle, the qPCR machine looks at that tube and uh, draws on this graph a point of how bright, how bright that relative fluorescence is in that tube. And uh, what we're looking for is when that amount of fluorescence crosses some kind of threshold that we call the CT. Um, so this is uh, when it crosses that threshold is what that T stands for. So I wanna pull in here again, we've got a fluorescent dye, we're looking at all sorts of different things. Uh, so what does this look like in the tube? So qPCR uses a fluorescent dye. You can see again here, we have our target DNA in red in our larger complex DNA sample. And we're gonna make a copy of that. So we have one copy and now we're going to make two. And we have a little bit of eight copies and it gets a little brighter still. And we keep making more and more copies and it keeps getting brighter and brighter and brighter. So by looking at how bright the tube is, we can actually start to see how much DNA is in our tube at that point. And now we can draw these nice curves of our exponential amplification and look at that PCR as it's happening. So Again, your starting DNA concentration will affect your CT. Um, and so here in this green line, we had a low starting concentration, or sorry, in the green line, we had a high starting concentration. In the yellow line, we had a low starting concentration. And so that green line that started off with a higher concentration will cross that threshold first. So qPCR can actually allow us to watch a PCR reaction as it happens using fluorescence and it can give us an idea of how much DNA we had in that tube to start. And this can be really, really important for things like viral load. Um, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna be talking about COVID-19, um, but again, remember there are viruses like HIV and herpes where we already know that viral load is important, where we're not as sure uh, of that with COVID-19 at this point. So, uh, Here's the thing about qPCR is that it is a hugely important laboratory technique. It allows us to do a lot of really cool investigations in the lab, uh, as well as looking at things like gene expression, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, but a qPCR machine is a really big machine. 
and it can cost tens of thousands of dollars. So while it is a really important piece of lab equipment, um, you know, it's very expensive for a reason. It needs to be very perfectly calibrated to look at the fluorescence in these really tiny tubes, to watch it at very precise amounts. Um, but it's not really uh, something that I could have in my apartment here today or that many classrooms can actually have access to to do qPCR uh, in that sort of setting. So instead, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to really break qPCR down to its fundamentals and we're going to look at how we can use, again, PCR amplification and some sort of fluorescence viewer to really look at the principles of qPCR and apply that to thinking about things like COVID-19. So, this little box that I have right here is our P51 fluorescence viewer. So what this is, um, is a little box that MiniPCR has developed, uh, which has a blue light inside, which you might be able to see here. You can see it shining on the lid right here. And what it does is it allows us to view fluorescence. Now there are a number of different labs that go into this. Um, it started off with the idea of looking at DNA structure. And so in here uh, is a little picture of Rosalind Franklin, who uh, was instrumental in figuring out the structure of DNA. So P51 was an image taken under her direction in her lab, which allowed us to actually look at the double-stranded structure of DNA. So this is our little ode to Rosalind Franklin by naming it P51. Um, but what it's gonna let us do today is it's gonna allow us to view fluorescence uh, in our PCR tubes. So I'm gonna look at the screen here to make sure you can see it without reflections. But here we have three glowing tubes, uh, and you can see when I turn off the blue light, you don't see the glow, but when I turn on the blue light, you can see the glow. And so what we can see here uh, is that there is something in our tubes, and we're going to talk about what that something is. Okay, so this is our little fluorescence viewer. So again, very small, very compact, very tiny. I can have it here in my apartment, uh, and I could not toss around a QPCR machine like this. but. These are the relative components. So what we're gonna talk through today is the mini PCR qPCR lab. So this lab is really a platform that we can use to talk about the principles of qPCR using much more accessible equipment. So I wanna make the point here that this is not a COVID-19 testing lab. For those of you who might've already performed our qPCR lab in your classroom or at home, you'll know that this is not a diagnostic lab. And what we're gonna be looking at today is not COVID-19 but it will help us to actually illustrate how the COVID-19 test works. And that's really the beauty of this, is that we don't need to be doing the real test to understand the fundamentals and the principles of how it's working. So what we're gonna do, and what I've actually done already, uh, is set up three different sample tubes. So uh, the lab comes with just a few different components. We've got water here. We have, again, our qPCR primers. These are going to uh, talk or these are going to target exactly what part of our complex DNA sample we're gonna to want to amplify. We have some water, we have our DNA sample. Uh, so this is gonna be our starting DNA. And then over, protected from light over here, we also have a tube of our master mix. So what's in here is everything you need to run qPCR. So these are gonna be the building blocks. We have a buffer that keeps everything happy and we have our DNA uh, dye that is going to bind to double-stranded but not single-stranded uh, DNA and fluoresce so that we can actually watch how many cycles of amplification we're doing. Now, I've got this set up a little bit uh, cooking, sto cooking show style. So I have already set up a bunch of our tubes here. And so what I've put into each of these tubes is labeled up here on the screen. So again, we have three different tubes. Our first tube, then we have a tube labeled H. This is gonna be our tube that has a high concentration of starting DNA. And then we have our tube labeled L, which is gonna have our low starting concentration of DNA. And so that's what I've put into each of these. The first tube started off with water, the next tube started off with a lot of DNA, and the next tube started off with a little bit of DNA. To each of those, I've added our primers, which again will help us to amplify just the region we want. And then finally, we have our master mix in there. So what we're gonna do is we are going to actually run a PCR and we are going to take our tubes out every few cycles to see what they look like in our fluorescent box and to see if we can actually watch that uh, amplification happen and track it as it does. So what we're gonna do, again, we're gonna take out our tubes and we're gonna compare them to these reference values that I've put up here on the screen. So when we start off 
hopefully, we're going to have uh, not much of our uh, DNA in our tubes, so it's going to look like tube zero. Then we're going to have uh, different levels of fluorescence that might look like zero, one, two, or three. And so every time we look at a tube, we're going to ask ourselves, okay, does this look like a zero? Does this look like a one, a two, or a three? And this is all going to make sense as we actually start to do it. So first of all, what we're going to do before we do anything, we're going to look at a bunch of our tubes uh, here. So I have some tubes that are uh, our cycle zero tubes here. And what you will notice uh, is that they're all green. These are bright green tubes. And you might be asking, well, how, how is this going to work if we're actually starting off at three, right? It can't go any higher than three. Well, what's happening here is that these tubes are cold. Um, and so we have a bunch of primers in there and the primers might be binding to each other and they're acting as our double stranded DNA. And so we're seeing this fluorescence. So what we actually have to do to get this going, um, again, because we're going to have to separate the strands. So we start off at sort of a blank canvas. So again, here on the left, we have our double stranded DNA that has been denatured by heat. And so uh, you can see that it won't glow, but then when it comes back together, when it's cold, uh, it is going to glow. And so we're going to be stopping our cycles at a specific point where only our amplified DNA should be bound and glowing. And again, we're going to walk through that so you'll be able to see it. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to program our qPCR machine. So you can see I have all of these uh, components up here, but I'm actually going to walk you through it on the machine. So we're going to switch over to a slightly different view here. So what I have here um, is I have my uh, mini PCR machine just plugged into my computer right now. This is my little mini 16. Um, so we are just going to walk through and we're going to actually program this together because it's going to take us all of about 60 seconds. It's very fast. So I actually have a heat block running right now. So I'm going to stop that. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to build a new PCR protocol. So we're just going to click new. I'm going to name this qPCR webinar. And now uh, I have all of the cycle settings up over on the side. So it's going to set up for an initial denaturation of 60 seconds to actually separate these two strands apart. Then we're going to denature uh, each cycle for eight seconds. We're going to anneal each cycle for eight seconds at 57 degrees Celsius. And then we're going to do our extension 72 degrees Celsius for eight seconds, and then it'll have a final extension of 30 seconds. And again, that's all you need to do. It's very fast. Um, and so I am just going to click save here because I already have some uh, set up, but you would just click run and that would be instantly set to the mini PCR machine. But again, I don't want you, all of this would run in under about an hour, but I don't want you to have to wait here for an additional hour. So I already have a bunch of tubes that I've cycled out for you uh, and taken pictures of so that we can walk through this, pretending like we've already been here for 30 minutes as it starts to cycle and run. So I'm gonna put this guy back to the heat block and I'm going to pop back here to my slides. So the first cycle, what we're gonna do is we're gonna denature to 94 degrees Celsius. And this is gonna break all of those double-stranded pieces of DNA apart and what you would be able to see uh, is that when it's completely broken apart, this is what these tubes look like. So uh, these will all look like zero, zero, zero. So this is what your starting point is. You have no fluorescence in the tubes and it looks just like this. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna allow the PCR to run and we're gonna stop it after the extension step at every point of the way and see how different it looks from here. So again, we're gonna stop it during the 72C extension phase. So it will have just made a double-stranded copy of DNA and we're gonna actually check and see what it looks like. So what I have done uh, is I have made a little Google Sheet so that we can actually go through and track this in real time. So I'm gonna get uh, a couple of my little starter tubes ready here. Um, and I've labeled them all with their different cycles. And of course I picked them up from different places. So we're gonna get those tubes ready. Um, but again, all I have done here is I have made a graph um, where we can look at our fluorescence values and cycle 10 wasn't very interesting. And so it just looked zero, zero, zero like before. So I'm not gonna show you cycle 10, but we can start off by looking at cycle 13. So again, it's a little hard to tell here. Is this a zero, is this a one? Um, one of the really nice things about this lab is that 
you're kind of arguing over what it is and you can really sort of get students engaged in is it a zero, is it a one, is it a two? Um, I think looking at these tubes in real time, uh, on the left here are my cycle 13 tubes. Uh, so they should be to, I think to the left, I think I'm mirrored on your screen potentially, uh, but it's these, whoop, these tubes right here are cycle 13. And so my picture is a little bad, but by eye, I really do not see any fluorescence in any of those tubes in cycle 13. Um, and I am not a great, uh, whoop, there we go. Maybe you can see them now. So cycle 13, there's not much fluorescence in those tubes. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to come down here to my graph and I'm going to say, okay, this is still a zero, a zero, and a zero in my tubes. But you might have actually gotten a quick look uh, at the next tube, um, which is cycle 16. And I'm going to move through here. And you might actually be able to see that, okay, if we compare cycle, oh, now they're cooling down. So as I mentioned before, as they cool down, they'll start to glow because all those primers will start to glow too. So I'm going to put them in here. But here you can see in our picture, uh, that middle tube is starting to look like it's glowing. And so as I get these tubes back to uh, 72 degrees Celsius for a second, you should be able to see that in these tubes too, that now when we're looking at this, it's hopefully <laughs> clearer to see that there we go. So hopefully you can see that that middle tube has just started to glow. So again, this is, uh, I think, easier to see sort of on this camera or by eye than it is in the pictures I've taken. Um, so I'm going to now come down to my results down here. I'm going to say, okay, this is probably a zero, a one, and a zero still. So we're going to go through these, um, and I'm not going to make you look at every single tube set with me, but I did take pictures of them. And I want to point out here that these pictures uh, were just taken with my cell phone. So you don't need any sort of crazy fancy visualization equipment here. All I have is this little box, and I took these pictures right with my cell phone. You don't need any sort of super fancy equipment. So cycle 16, I would say it's a zero, a one, and a zero. And now, ooh. What do people think about cycle 19? I'm actually gonna come down and look in the comments here for a second. So I think it's pretty clear that the first one is still a zero and then the last one is still a zero. Uh, but what do people think about the middle one? Do we think that's more of a two or do we think that's already jumped up to a three? I'm gonna wait for the chat to catch up for just a second because I, I want you to tell me. Um, so this is cycle 19, we're looking, is it a two? Is it a three? Oh, nobody's telling me anything in the chat probably a little bit of a lag. Um, but I think, I think that might already be a three. Oh yeah. All right. Now they're showing up. Yeah. This is definitely a three. So I'm going to put a three in here. And so now we're going to go through the rest of these. Um, again, I think this still looks uh, cycle 22. I think, oh yeah, everybody's telling me it's a three. Awesome. So I think this still looks like a zero, a three and a zero, uh, which is great. And then cycle 25, I would now say that maybe that looks like a zero, a three, and like a 1.5, right? I don't know if that looks more like a one or a two, uh, but I'm going to say, oops, at cycle 25, I'm going to say that's a zero, a three, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this a 1.5. I'm going to gonna make that happen. So again, there's a little bit of argument here. You're just looking at it with your eyes, but even with your eyes, you can see that there's a difference in these tubes. Um, so now cycle 28, okay, now I think we're definitely at a zero, a three, and a two. I think we've definitely probably hit the two stage. Um, and I'm gonna pop my uh, later cycles in here just to try and show you. Um, but now we're gonna get to cycle 30. And I think now this looks like a zero, a three and a three. So we're just doing this by eye. We're just looking at these uh, on the screen in the pictures, or we're just looking at them in these little tubes. But even just by doing that, first of all, you can see a couple things. You can see that I built these very clunky graphs here just in Google Sheets, but they look like 
those X looking, looking at these every three cycles. So we're really getting sort of a coarser look at these. Um, if you wanted to take a look at them every cycle, you might be able to plot that out a little bit better. If you wanted to make slightly different reference values where you could get much more granular ideas, you could try and do that as well. But really in just a few minutes um, in real time using just this little fluorescence viewer and this thermocycler, we have created uh, plots that look like these qPCR plots. The other thing I want to point out is that if we just looked at the end point here, if we just looked at cycle 30 here on the screen, tube 2 and tube 3 look identical. If you just showed me this image, I would not be able to tell you which one started off with a higher DNA concentration and which one started off with a lower DNA concentration. But by going through it this way, you can actually uh, look here and see that we did draw these curves and we can see a difference in how those reactions proceeded. We can see who ran the race fastest and we can see that our high tube had a higher DNA concentration than our low tube. Uh, which I think is super cool uh, because I did qPCR a lot in graduate school and never actually got to see it in real time. And so this is, for me, this is actually just really cool to be able to see this uh, in this format. And I think it's also really nice to be able to take this sort of mysterious black box that is a qPCR machine where you put your tubes or your plate in and they go away into a machine and the machine tells you results. And I think it's really, our lab allows us to look at the fundamentals of qPCR. Um, it's not designed as a clinical lab. Uh, it's really designed to let us look at how these reactions proceed and how they work. Um, and it is not currently designed as a COVID-19 testing lab. Like that is uh, not how it is written, but you can use it to talk about those same principles. Because again, this is very similar to how the COVID test is done is by using qPCR or quantitative PCR. And again, that's, I don't actually think that I've mentioned that. I think I missed that on that slide. So the Q of qPCR stands for quantitative. So it allows you to find out the quantity of DNA you started with. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit though about how uh, the actual COVID-19 qPCR test differs from uh, qPCR that works like this. So, oops, that's back to my mini PCR program. So remember at the very beginning, I said that the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 genome is made of RNA, not DNA. And so we're starting off with RNA, but qPCR is amplifying DNA. So we actually have to do a step first called reverse transcription to actually turn that RNA genome into DNA. So we can put in an RT, uh, a reverse transcriptase, and it will go to that RNA genome and create a DNA copy. And now that we have this DNA copy, now we can actually start doing qPCR on our samples. So we had DNA or we had RNA and now we've made DNA. And so from here, we can actually go on and do qPCR. But what we've talked about today uh, is qPCR using a dye that binds sort of indiscriminately to double-stranded DNA. And that's how a lot of qPCR is done. If you've worked in a lab, you might know this as cyber. Um, so if people are talking about doing like a cyber green qPCR, that's what they're talking about. But this actually uses a slightly different technology uh, that you may have heard called TACMAN maybe, or TAC probes. Um, so what this is, is works by a very similar manner where first you denature your DNA, you have primers that come in to specify the exact position uh, that you want to amplify that specific target region. And then what you have is you have a third piece of DNA that comes in called your probe. And what you have here is you have this little fluorescent uh, or potentially fluorescent molecule at the front and then what's called a quencher at the back. Um, and so when they're together here bound to DNA, there's no fluorescence. But when your polymerase comes in, so first it'll make a copy of that. Uh, and then now when it makes a copy of this strand and it knocks off that probe, that probe releases fluorescence. So what happens is as you make new copies, you're releasing this molecule, which can now go on and fluoresce. So again, it works in the same way. You're watching the amount of fluorescence in your tube increase over time, but rather than a, bi uh, rather than a dye that binds to any double-stranded DNA, it will only fluoresce if it's coming off of that specific piece because it's you have this uh, probe that's specifically designed to pair to some part of your target region. So why do we use qPCR and not normal PCR to diagnose things like COVID-19? 
So one of the reasons is that it's really fast and it's high throughput. So the COVID-19 test, uh, rather than using, you know, three tubes at a time like this, it's actually using a plate that has 96 of these tubes on it at once. You can test a lot of samples at once in a qPCR machine. And you also don't have to take that uh, reaction and move it to another a uh, piece of equipment like a gel electrophoresis box to see your results. So all in one machine, you're doing the amplification and you're getting to see the results in real time. So uh, that Q uh, for qPCR stands for quantitative. Sometimes you might also hear people call it RT-PCR, uh, which can get a little confusing. This is a little inside baseball, but sometimes you'll hear RT-qPCR, that stands for reverse transcriptase qPCR. So that's uh, what we're doing here where we take that RNA and we reverse transcribe it into DNA. But sometimes people also use RT-PCR to stand for real-time PCR. So there's a lot of letters floating around here, but the idea is that you're looking at it in real time. So as it's running, you can see how these results are progressing. And again, uh, in COVID-19 so far, we don't have any evidence uh, that, or it's very inconclusive. We're at the beginning stages of research, so we're not sure if viral load matters much, but for a lot of other viruses like HIV and herpes, viral load matters a lot. So being able to get some sort of quantitation here is also really important. And so it's just sort of become the standard for clinical diagnostics is to use qPCR rather than regular PCR for this whole bundle of reasons. But this is not qPCR's only job. We don't just use it for diagnostics. We also use it for something called gene expression. And there are a lot of different gene expression stories out there, but if you remember, DNA is turned into RNA, is turned into protein in your body. That's how uh, proteins are made. You have DNA, it goes to RNA, it goes to protein. But every one of our cells has exactly the same, except for red blood cells, has the same DNA genome in it. But we have different uh, genes that are turned on or off in different cells. So for example, different genes are turned on in my skin cells than are turned on in my hair cells because they have different needs. So they can be turned on or off in different cells, or they can be turned on or off or up and down kind of like a volume knob in uh, response to different environmental factors. So why do I have astronauts up here? And it's because one of, I think, the most popular gene expression stories that went out there into the world and got a little confused was the story of Scott and Mark Kelly. Uh, so. NASA had twin astronauts. They sent one to space for a year and they left the other down on the ground. And they did a whole host of experiments to see what happened to the astronaut that went to space for a year versus the one that stayed on the ground. And what happened to him as sort of a before and after of being exposed to the microgravity environment up in space for an entire year. And so when he came back down, there were a lot of news stories that went out that said that something like 7% of his genes had changed and he'd had all these different uh, things he had new space genes and he had all of these things. What the scientists had actually looked like and what was actually changed was his gene expression. So 7% of his genes did not suddenly mutate into new genes, right? That would be a large percentage of genes. You know, if you think about the fact that we are something like 97% related to a, you know, chimpanzee, if 7% of our genes changed, like we would be a different species. Um, but 7% of his genes changed their gene expression. So 7% of their genes either made more or less RNA in response to the space environment, which would mean that they would make more or less protein at a very basic level. So qPCR can actually help us look at that because again, qPCR lets us quantify things. So we can use qPCR to quantify the amount of RNA that a gene is making. Has its expression been turned up? Is it making a lot of RNA in response to an environment like space? Or has its expression been turned down? Is it making much less RNA? Um, in response to that new environment. So you can use qPCR, and one of the ways that it's really used a lot in the lab is to look at gene expression, to look at, okay, we've done something in the lab to our you know, system, has that changed whether or not you can turn a, um, whether or not the gene has turned up its volume of how much RNA it's making, or has it turned down its volume of how much RNA it's making. So 
This, diagnostics are not the only job for qPCR, and I will take any excuse I can get to put up a picture of astronauts and talk about the fact that going to space changes the expression of your genes by about 7%. That's wild. That's really cool. And what's also cooler is that they then returned to normal, most of them returned to normal Earth levels when he came back. So just sort of a cool story. Now, coming back to COVID-19 and coming back to actually using qPCR for diagnostic testing, Again, as you've probably heard, we need to get testing out to almost everyone quickly. We need to really rapidly expand how we can get testing out to more people. And there are different sort of strategies that need to be taken here. So one of those is that we really need to expand centralized testing centers. So we need to be able to increase the capacity of the places that are already doing testing so that they can be testing more people. Um, but again, this is hard for a lot of reasons, uh, and we'll get to some of those in the Q&A a little bit later, but imagine that you are a baker, um, and this is an uh, analogy that was related to me by Allie on our team, uh, and I think she said she heard it from NPR, but let's say you're a baker and you are making bread, and you suddenly have to go from making 20 loaves of bread a day to making 2,000 loaves of bread a day. So not only are you gonna need more eggs and flour and all the different things that go into your bread, you're also probably gonna need a new oven, you're probably gonna need a new mixer, you're gonna need new equipment. And so that's one of the things about expanding these centralized testing centers is you can think about the test like making a loaf of bread. So not only are you probably gonna need more people to do the testing or bake those more loaves of bread, you're also gonna need more of the chemicals that go into that test, those reagents, sort of like your eggs and your flour. Um, and at some point you're probably gonna need to say, okay, I can't do all of this by hand, I need a robot to help me. So again, we have some amazing uh, testing robots that are out there in the world, but centers that typically test, you know, 20 patients a day for a number of different diseases are now being asked to test uh, 2,000 patients a day. So they really need to change the scale of what they're doing. And that requires getting more of these reagents. It requires getting um, more machines. It might require getting more people. So that's one way we need to expand testing is we need to take these centralized testing centers and just ramp up how many tests they're doing. Uh, and people are doing that. There are great pushes to do that right now. But we also need to think about getting testing into places where we can't do that because again, these are big machines. Um, and if you wanna go test somebody who doesn't have access to one of these centralized testing centers in more re remote locations, it's gonna be a lot harder to actually take that machine and then go out uh, into uh, some place where you're not gonna have maybe a hookup for these machines, or you're not gonna have a lab ready to receive it, or you're not gonna have 20 people to be able to do this. So how can we get to those more remote places? Um, uh, oh, and we'll, we'll skip that for now. We'll come back to antibody testing. So one of the ways that we might actually want to be able to do that uh, is by using some of these smaller pieces. So again, I wanna make it very clear that we are not doing this. Uh, Mini PCR Bio, we are not the people doing this, but there are some groups who have taken our equipment and are trying to use them to go into these remote locations and try and expand testing uh, in a much more accessible, a slightly cheaper, and a definitely much more uh, carryable way, right? So how do we take these things and make testing more accessible to more people? So this is an amazing preprint out of a group down at uh, UC Santa Barbara. So uh, they have a system called Crest. And so what they're doing is they're combining PCR to amplify uh, DNA. They're using fluorescence to look at that amplification and then they're using a CRISPR system. So we had a whole webinar last week on what is CRISPR, but CRISPR diagnostics are becoming more and more of a uh, potential uh, platform to be doing diagnostics out in the field. So the idea here at its most basic level is that CRISPR can find and cleave specific pieces of DNA. And sometimes there are some CRISPR systems that once they've done that, they now are activated and they'll go on to cleave sort of lots of different things. So what we can do for this kind of test is we can make lots of copies of our target DNA that might be our SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome. Then we can put in a CRISPR system that is designed to find that SARS-CoV-2 uh, region of nucleic acids it will cleave it, and then if we have these uh, fluorescent molecules that it can also cleave in the tube that are bound to DNA, it will then start to release lots and lots of fluorescence. Whereas if it doesn't find that SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome from that amplification, it won't cleave those and you won't see amplification. So 
this is a really cool paper um, that if you're interested in this, I, I think it's relatively accessible to read. So I would say you could go and read this on BioArchive. Um, but it's sort of a platform that they're trying to use to use PCR and fluorescence to try and diagnose disease along with CRISPR. And again, uh, Emily did an amazing CRISPR webinar last week that you can check out on our channel if you want to find out more about CRISPR specifically. Um, so also there are platforms like this. So this is another group in Mexico, I believe, who's using, um, again, our PCR machine. Uh, and over here, you can see our blue gel box, which is a similar concept to uh, the P51, where you can use a blue light to view fluorescence. And they're uh, using this in combination with a plate reader to try and amplify pieces of the SARS-CoV-2 genome and then use fluorescence to say, are they or are they not present in our sample? Um, so again, they're taking uh, really sort of uh, small accessible tools and making a different type of test to be able to reach these different places. Uh, and again, I want to stress that we are not uh, in charge of any of these projects. We are not making a COVID-19 test, but there are other groups out there who are using our technology to actually go out and do this, which is pretty cool. I think it's cool that you can take something like this that I can hold in two hands and have in my apartment and try and go out and bring testing to more people. I think that that's awesome and really cool. Um, I did want to come back here just for a second and mention antibody testing. So again, the qPCR test that we or that the broader testing uh, world is doing right now uses that swab that very uncomfortably goes up your nose uh, and tries to get a sample. What it relies on is that there is active virus currently present in you right now. That's what that swab is looking for, is do you have an active infection right now that has that viral RNA in it? But something like an antibody test, which looks to see, okay, has your immune system respond, responded to the virus and created antibodies against it, can let us see not only do you have an infection now, but did you have one earlier. So it can let us go back and look and see, okay, have you already had the virus, even if you don't have it right now? And so again, it's there's a lot of great science happening right now. Everybody's trying to figure out things right now. Um, typically, having antibodies to something will mean that you will likely have an immunity towards it. Again, it's kind of too early days to say right now what level that immunity would be for something like SARS-CoV-2. But the idea is that we might be able to use antibody testing to see, okay, what broader swath of the population might not have the virus now, but had it in the past, and what might that mean for immunity. And so we're going to need a whole variety of testing, both centralized testing centers and remote testing and qPCR testing and antibody testing, and all of these to come together to really get a full scope of the disease and how it has spread through the community. So, uh, oh, and somebody has just asked uh, if we would post the DOI for the last two articles. Um, and so the DOI is actually on these slides and there is a link in the description below where you can download uh, these PowerPoint slides. So you'll be able to come back and see uh, this DOI later, but I will also uh, actually uh, make sure that I will come back to this uh, after the webinar is closed and I will put those links directly in the description box down below. So you can get them from here now or about 15 minutes after this is done, they should be uploaded as well. So uh, we've gone through a lot of information today talking about qPCR, talking about COVID-19, uh, and I did want to answer a couple of the questions that came up beforehand uh, when you submitted your webinar registration. So one of the things uh, that came up was somebody asked, why is there so much trouble with false positives and false negatives with this test? So the very first thing I want to do is I actually want to talk about what is a false positive and what is a false negative, because I think that these are terms that you probably heard a bunch on the news right now with very little explanation of what they are. So the idea here uh, is that there are two possible scenarios. Either you have a disease or you don't have a disease. And then there are two possible test results. Either you got a positive test or you got a negative test. So something can be a true positive if you actually have the disease and you get a positive test. You have a true negative if you do not have the disease and you have a negative test. But you can get a false negative if you have the disease and you get a negative test. You can get a false positive if you have the disease, or sorry, if you don't have the disease, but you get a positive test. Now, these true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives 
are part of every diagnostic test out there. There is, I don't know that there is a, with some exceptions, there are very few tests that are 100% perfect on giving you only true positives and true negatives. So when people design tests, they do a lot of different things to try and make sure that they're increasing their number of true positives and true negatives while decreasing their number of false positives and false negatives. Now, if you think about something like qPCR, it is a lot easier to get a false negative than it would be to get a false positive because we're amplifying uh, this DNA in the tube. So to get a false positive, you will only amplify something if it's in that tube. So if you contaminate a sample with another sample, if you contaminate a negative sample with a positive sample, you might get a false positive. And you might tell somebody that they have the disease when they didn't actually have it, their sample just got contaminated with somebody else's. But it's a lot more possible for something like these tests to get a false negative. So let's say that swab is taken, but it's really uncomfortable to have the swab taken. Maybe you flinched, maybe they didn't get a good sample. Maybe you have the virus, but they just didn't pick it up on that swab. You could get a false negative. Or maybe as that swab was being transferred to the testing lab, maybe it was left out, it got warm, you know, the RNA degraded or something, you could get a false negative. So for something like qPCR, it's a lot more likely to get a false negative than it is to get a false positive. And as we're seeing more and more antibody tests come out uh, into the world, again, each test is designed a little differently. There are lots of them out there right now, but each one is going to have a different level of false positives and false negatives. And that's something that researchers really try and balance of how good is their specificity and their sensitivity. These are two other words you might hear as well. So sensitivity is how sensitive it is to actually finding that result. And specificity is how specific it is to finding the right result. Um, and so again, you want to write, because it's possible you could get a false positive if let's say your antibody test picks up all viruses, right? Let's say you have an antibody test that's just looking for any sort of uh, viral reactivity. Well, yes, it will tell you every time you have uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive because it, you're telling somebody that they have a yes anytime they have a virus, but you're also gonna get a lot of false positives. Um, so you're gonna get high true positives, but also a lot of false positives. Um, so there's a lot that goes into this. There's a lot of research, but for qPCR, you're more likely to get false negatives than you are to get false positives. And really the thing I want you to take away from here is just this chart of what is a true positive, a false positive, a false negative, a true negative. I think this is really the key here is just understanding what these things mean and understanding as well that when you design a test, there are gonna be some trade-offs of, you could just say everything is a yes, and then you're gonna have a whole bunch of true positives, but a lot of false positives too. So things you have to balance and keep in mind. Okay, a couple other questions that came in that I want to address. Um, and thank you as well to Ali and Sebastian for answering a bunch of the chat questions as they've been coming up. I don't think there are any left for me to answer because they're going through all those. So these are again, a couple more questions from the uh, answer or the questions you submitted beforehand. So I like this first question. Can qPCR primers work effectively in a standard PCR reaction? Can a standard PCR be used for definitive SARS-CoV-2 detection? So again, you can imagine that in the qPCR, you are amplifying the, that region of DNA. I could take these tubes and I could run them out on a uh, gel and I could see are there bands or are there not bands. But typically for something like qPCR, we're making really short uh, amplicons. So those regions, those regions that we're trying to amplify are very short. Um, and so they'd be a little bit harder to distinguish on the gel because they'd be very tiny. Um, so it is possible. Um, it all works on the very same uh, backbone of PCR. So there are just a couple of idiosyncrasies that are different between qPCR and normal PCR. Um, but uh, you could also, again, use a standard PCR if you designed the primers to be a little longer, just to make them a little easier to see on the gel. You could totally uh, make a standard PCR to be a diagnostic for, for SARS-CoV-2 but again, there are a lot of benefits to doing qPCR that have made it the diagnostic standard, including the fact that it's high throughput, it's really fast, and you don't need to do that second step of visualizing it on a gel. You just see all the results all at once, which is really nice. Um, the second question I really wanted to address as well was, I've heard most of the testing shortages are due to reagent shortages. 
what are the reagents that are being used and where do they come from as in how are they produced. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the specifics of all of that, but I want to come back to that analogy that I shared earlier where you're a baker and you have a bunch of different things that need to go into your bread and uh, suddenly you, and this is happening here too, right? I love baking bread. Uh, there's no yeast on the shelves at the stores right now. And for a while it was a little hard to find, um, you know, flour on the sh shelves. And that's because suddenly everybody around the country is trying to do the same test at the same time. And everybody around the country is trying to bake bread at the same time. So we're all using up those resources. Um, and it doesn't mean that there's not more coming, but you can imagine that, you know, there are chickens out there who lay eggs and they're used to laying a certain amount of eggs at the same time. And you can't just suddenly ask that chicken to lay two eggs a day. Um, and so, you know, I know that for things like flour, there's a big wheat store, but they uh, only mill it at certain quantities to get it out into the world at certain times. Um, and they weren't expecting this big spike and it's the same thing for reagents so there are reagents that are used to extract the RNA from the sample and then reagents you know the polymerase and the primers and all the different things you need in your qPCR tube to actually make the polymerase uh, to actually make the polymerase chain reaction run so nobody was expecting such a large spike in needing all of these things right now so we're just having to create these reagents faster and faster than they're typically consumed and that we typically um, would expect to be using them and it's again, it's the same thing you probably heard about masks, right? There's a certain number of masks that people expect are going to be bought in, what is it, May each year, but suddenly that demand has really increased. So people, are, manufacturers uh, of all of the different reagents that go into this are just trying to come up with those things faster. Um, and again, there are also testing shortages, as I mentioned before. If you bake 20 loaves of bread a day and suddenly you have to bake 2,000 loaves of bread a day, you're going to have to change up what your kitchen looks like. You're going to have to find a new space, new equipment, all of that. So the testing centers are doing their best to find as many reagents as possible and new equipment as possible. But again, everybody is doing this all at once. So it's putting a little bit of stress on the system of getting those reagents and getting all of that uh, out to everybody quickly. Um, so we've hit about an hour now, so I just want to wrap up quickly. If you want to learn more about qPCR, we have a series of explainers called DNA Dots. So these are simple explanations of modern genetic techniques. And we have one all about qPCR, quantitative polymerase chain reaction, that goes through all these details. And it's a great sort of two-page explainer um, that I think is really useful. And I, I always love to plug the DNA Dots because this 100% was a coincidence, but I was in... Uh, I was in grad school. I was looking for a good solid explainer on uh, digital droplet PCR, which is another thing that DNA Dots is on. And that was the first uh, example that came up in my Google search and I read it and it was wonderful. So these are things that I have actually used in my own research, but they're also accessible uh, to people outside of the lab as well. So I love the DNA Dots and they've actually helped me in my own work. We also have a whole bunch of resources for teachers as well. So we have uh, all of our educational resources. So we have a previous COVID-19 uh, webinar. We have our food safety lab webinar is gonna be next week. Uh, so that's gonna be with Katie. It's gonna be part of our Genes in Space programming, which you still have time to enter the Genes in Space contest if you'd like to. Uh, we had our CRISPR webinar last week. We had an awesome cell-free technology webinar uh, by Ali and Jessica a while back. Bruce did a webinar. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of content out there for for you right now, as well as PowerPoints and worksheets and additional educational resources on our website. So if you are a teacher or a student who is looking for more resources, please go to minipcr.com slash educational resources. And there's a bunch there just ready and waiting for you. So with that, uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, there was a great discussion happening in the uh, talk or in the chat. So I really appreciate you all joining us. Again, there's more information in the description box down below. So you can check that out. And I hope that you've learned a little bit more uh, and you can go and bring this knowledge out to talking to your friends when everybody's talking about COVID testing and what in the world is that qPCR thing. So again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, leave any additional questions in the comments down below and yeah. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.